This is the AT&T Globalist 630. I've had it on the channel a number of times now, and it's definitely one of my favorites in my collection. It has 100 megahertz Pentium, 16 megabytes of RAM, an S3 Trio 64, an ESS audio drive, and we've even added a SCSI card with a blue SCSI. Uh, this thing's already an ideal late DOS and early Windows gaming machine, so there's really no reason for me to even upgrade this. That's boring though, and I want to see just how far we can actually push it. Uh, this is a Socket 5 system, and as far as Socket 5 goes, uh, there's not really a ton of room to go upwards. Now, most of you watching this are probably at least vaguely familiar with what Socket 7 is, uh, which launched in 1995 and lasted way longer than anybody expected, thanks mostly to AMD. Socket 7, however, was the replacement for the second generation of Pentium Socket, which was Socket 5. Socket 4 was for the very early Pentiums, and Socket 6 was... a thing, technically, but we won't get into that. But what if I told you that Socket 5 and Socket 7 are actually the same? No, like genuinely, they're the exact same socket as each other. Physically, they're the same. Even electrically, they're almost the exact same as well. This means you can actually put an older Socket 5 CPU into a Socket 7 board, and it should work just fine. But the same goes in the opposite direction, with a few caveats. Obviously, Socket 7 had to introduce something new to justify its existence, and there were two major things that differentiate it from Socket 5. The first wouldn't actually show up until a little while after launch, and that was the ability for split-voltage CPU support. Granted, I think this is more of a motherboard change than a socket change, but uh, there aren't any Socket 5 boards that can properly accept these new voltage CPUs, at least without modification. Socket 5 is just meant to run at 3.3 volts, not 3.3 volts for I.O. and a lower core voltage like you can find later on with Socket 7. So even if we were to try to put a newer Socket 7 chip in here, it'll have to be of the older style of Pentium, which is known as the P54CS or most of the non-MMX-equipped Pentiums. Uh, we could put a non-Intel chip in here, but that's getting way out of the scope of today's project. The second major change from 5 to 7 was the addition of extra pins used for setting the CPU multiplier. Instead of just adding new pins, Intel just took pins that weren't really being used for anything important on Socket 5 and used them to give Socket 7 chips more multiplier settings. Socket 5 was actually quite limiting in that aspect, having only a single pin for multipliers, which meant you were stuck with only two options, a 1.5x multiplier or a 2x multiplier. And the front side bus was pretty much usually stuck at either just 60 or 66 megahertz. So there's not a ton of options there. That means we could take this system from 100 megahertz to 133 megahertz without having to do any modifications. And I do have this Pentium 133 that would be a great fit in here though. Though that's just not really that special. I want to take it beyond its limits. But first, I want to do a quick detour. The 16 megabytes of RAM in here is just fine. Uh, there's absolutely no need to upgrade it. But it would be pretty cool. After all, this thing is pretty much a workstation at this point. A tower machine with a fast Pentium and a SCSI hard drive might as well bump up the RAM to match. I decided to drop in 64 megabytes, which is way more than almost anyone would have had in a personal machine at the time. This would not have been a cheap upgrade at the time. I have here a 32 megabyte RAM kit from roughly around this time period, and I mainly just wanted to show off this amazing box art. What's key though is that it has the original receipt from when it was bought. Bought on April 13th, 1997 from Staples in Victimville, California. Or, well, at the time it was still good, so we'll, we'll call it Victorville. Uh, I did look up this location on Mariposa Road, and uh, it's now a Vallarta's, so the Staples doesn't exist anymore. But they bought this kit for $195, and that was on sale before tax. The original list price was $299. And so you could probably double that original list price for buying 64 megabytes of RAM, especially if this was like 1996, 
which is kind of what the theme of this is becoming. Uh, yeah, not cheap. Uh, this does nothing for DOS performance, but it will help out with like Windows 95. Not that I have much of a reason to run 95 on here, uh, but it will help also for other experiments. Now moving on to the big point of the video, pushing the board past its limits. I want to put in this 166 megahertz Pentium, which should be impossible on the system. Well, it'll work just fine on the stock board, but it tops out at 133 megahertz, like we've already said. However, the only thing the jumpers, or in this case the dip switches on the motherboard are doing, are pulling some of those pins low on the bottom of the CPU. Now on Socket 5 there's only one pin being used, that which is BF0. But what if we were to take some wire, hook it to the unused BF1 pin, and connect it to ground? This should effectively add an extra multiplier option and give us a 2.5x multiplier. We could just directly jumper these points together, but then there wouldn't be any way to change it, so I'm going to add a small pin header that I can attach a jumper to. Uh, I just hot glued this to the top of the board, and yeah, it looks very janky. I'm not that pleased with how it looks, uh, but it works just fine. A switch would have been a lot more ideal, but uh, this is at least reversible without too much hassle. And it works, but the BIOS doesn't actually detect any frequency above 133. I guess they just didn't program it in. But if you look in various utilities and you look at the performance, uh, it does actually say it's running with a 2.5x multiplier. The machine did decide to break on me for like two hours where it would just refused to boot off of literally anything. It wouldn't even boot off of a floppy without freezing during the DOS, you know, boot up. And then it just fixed itself. So, cool. That's not concerning. At least the computer isn't broken. Permanently. I think. I don't think the mod had anything to do with this. I think it was just... 90s computer weirdness, but I'm very grateful that it's working again because I was really pulling my hair out with that. Now I did go ahead and compare the Pentium 100 that this came with, as well as the theoretical max Pentium 133 that a Socket 5 system would support against the Pentium 166. I didn't do a ton of benchmarking, it's all DOS benchmarking, but I think the point gets across. We're not really looking for what the Pentium 166 can do, more just does it work in the system and does it increase performance? And yes, it absolutely does. Scaling in benchmarks like 3D Bench and PC Player Benchmark make it very evident that uh, it is indeed working. It is definitely running at 166 megahertz. I will say though, don't sleep on the performance upgrade of just going to the 133 if you don't want to go through all this hassle. You have a Socket 5 system that's with a lower end Pentium, especially one that's not already at like 100 megahertz. Upgrading to the 133 is pretty significant, so don't think you need to do this mod to get like much better DOS gaming performance. Pentium 133 is still pretty dang good for pretty much every game you'd really want to play in DOS, but the Pentium 166 is definitely a good step above even the 133. In Doom we get pretty good scaling, although of course these are all already over Doom's max 35 FPS frame cap, so that's not really too helpful, but it's there. Of course the benchmark we all want to see is how does Quake run on it. Uh, the 100MHz Pentium doesn't quite hit 30 FPS. Uh, it certainly doesn't run bad. Um, it's fairly playable, especially given the standards of the time, but not amazing. The Pentium 133 just almost gets us to 30 FPS, just a tiny little bit under it. Uh, but yeah, that's a definitely a noticeable upgrade. The Pentium 166, instead of giving us another 5 FPS improvement, only increases the FPS by about 3. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why. You'd think there'd be, you know, kind of linear scaling there, but no. I'm suspecting we might be getting limited by the video chip on here. S3 Trio 64 is pretty good in DOS, but it's not, like, perfect by any means. So that could be affecting it, but still, 
we managed to go from like 25 FPS to over 30 FPS in Quake. That's pretty significant and you would definitely notice that in gameplay. So I am extremely pleased with how the mod turned out. Uh, the fact that it is reversible and I'm able to easily change it by just you know, pulling that jumper on and off so I could easily go back to either of these CPUs if I so desired. And this thing is just incredible now. I, I love this thing so much. Uh, there's so much I want to do with it. Obviously, I'm going to mess around with Windows 95 on here and stuff. Maybe some other stuff. Other operating systems. Uh, on our ESS sound card, I have equipped it with a MIDI module. Uh, I got the Dream Blaster S2, which is basically the cheapest MIDI module you can buy at this point. Uh, but despite it being, you know, the cheapest one, it actually sounds pretty good. I actually really like the way it sounds. Sure, it's not as good as a Sound Canvas or any of the Yamaha XG modules or whatever, but I think it sounds pretty good. And it definitely adds a lot more life to these DOS soundtracks because I adore FM synthesis. I am a passionate defender of FM, but WoW was just, just terribly used in the DOS era. Just horrific utilization of its capabilities. So having the MIDI is certainly nice. And that's gonna do it for the video. This is definitely not going to be the last you see of this machine. Maybe in terms of hardware upgrades it is, but Again, like I said, I want to do some other software messing about on it, which I think will be interesting. And yeah, so thank you guys for watching this video, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.